if I hear AI one more time, I, I just, I can't handle it anymore. Tell me how you really feel about that. <laughs> like, what's going on over there? I mean, there's one thing with buzzwords, but these two buzz letters, AI, it's driving me bonkers. <laughs> I, I feel like we got to talk about this. Like, I really do feel like we do, too. I mean, can we spend like a month on this? Let's go, baby. All of January. Nothing but AI. Okay, let's do it. Challenge accepted. Done. Welcome to the VIP Podcast. Season three. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Vertifor Insurance Podcast. I am super pumped to be hanging out today with, with two amazing guys, uh, with Tito and Mateo of Lou La. Uh, guys, if you haven't heard of them yet, get ready, buckle up, because we got a great episode coming at you. Uh, they've uh, done some pretty cool things with an agency called Aster that we're going to get into, and then uh, they announced some pretty amazing stuff that blew my mind over the last couple of months, and uh, really just in the last couple of weeks, really. So I can't wait for you to check that out. Uh, let's rock and roll. Tito, Mateo, what's going on, guys? Man, How's thank it, you so man? much for having us. Yeah, this is, uh, is going to be fun. We're excited. Yeah, I think we, we might be more excited than you guys are for sure. We've been talking about this for a hot minute now. Yeah. I mean, it's not every day you get an insurance conversation. It's going to be fun. So, uh, <laughs> hey, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. What are you trying to say here, man? <laughs> we try to make all of our conversations fun. Now. Uh, I think I think, I think it will be one of the rare insurance conversations that's fun, but uh, we're looking forward to it for sure. Well, we're about to blow your mind, man. So buckle up. Yeah, this dude. This is going to be the best conversation you've ever had. So I got to say, yeah. Mateo, that, that smile's looking good. You got anything you want to you know, talk about uh-huh. there? <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, it's the new sni- uh, Smile Direct Club, uh, I guess, Ventures. I don't know what the right word would be. I um, What do you call it? I put an order in for my replacement one because I lost – I lost my my nighttime dentures like two months ago, like the ones you wear after the treatment. And uh, sure enough, I placed my order two months ago. They tell me it's going to take three or four days to process. Next thing I know, I see on Twitter that they're going bankrupt. I reach out again, like, hey, just saw news, what's going on? Get ghosted for two months. Oh, my gosh. Yesterday, the the denture showed up. And uh, they were missing a few, so I had to come pick them up this morning. But uh, but yeah, my smile, if you think it's good now, give it six more weeks to get back. back, back. <laughs> hey, that sounds like the hard market we're working with right now in the insurance business. You know, you got some companies frustrated and maybe hitting some bankruptcy as well, man. So I thought that was interesting you brought that up. Yeah, I mean, especially here in Florida, what is it, like 14 insurance carriers that pulled out this year alone? California is yeah. five, so... I guess the I guess you can say the teeth industry is reminiscent of a uh, <laughs> market. That's awesome. Hey, let's uh, let's take a little bit. You know, talk a little bit about you guys. Tell me your guys' story. How you kind of got to where you are now? Maybe tell me a little bit about Aster, about Lula. You know, Tito, if you want to jump but start off for us. Yeah. So I mean, Lula has an interesting past. Um, uh, the co-founders are obviously Matthew and his twin brother Michael. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll get into it in more detail, but it was started in their college dorm room in Babson. And I just happened to live across the hall from them, uh, also at Babson. So we we became close friends and Lula was initially a peer to peer car sharing uh, app for students. Uh, now, in the rental game, as many uh, of your listeners probably know, insurance is a big big issue so we you know i was one of their biggest customers at that time and they kept complaining about how are we going to insure uh students basically because if you're under 25 years old uh for the rental game it's it's uh not something that carriers have much of an appetite for Mm -hmm. so uh matthew why don't you take it from there because that was that was kind of his ball game right there yeah, so it was funny. We got rejected by 47 insurance carriers. Oh and so gosh. we had to go back to all those insurance carriers and tell them, what if you don't accept the random 18-year-old off the street? What if you cover only 18-year-olds or students that fall under some sort of underwriting criteria? And we weren't venture back at that point. So we didn't have money to do checker, own FIVO, or Samba safety. So we had to start developing our own underwriting tools. 
And we ended up launching that September 1st, 2018. And I'll never forget at the end of the first month, the insurance company sent us a six column Excel sheet. And they said, hey, you're gonna have to put all the user information here. You have to put all the policy information for each trip and all the claims information. And I remember looking at that and I was still technically a student. I was like, there's no way I'm gonna manually do all this. Mm -hmm. And so we started developing tools to automate the entire process of insurance there. And because it was 18 year olds, that was where we really started getting into the world of developing these wonky commercial products because it was surplus lines. We clearly went through the three declination process with a 47. And so we really started getting well attuned with these, with these commercial line products. And then we scaled that business to have members on more than 500 campuses in all 50 states. Wow. And when COVID shut down college campuses, it shut down that business. And so my brother and I were trying to figure out what we were going to do with our life. We were two college dropouts, uh, failed business, middle of a global pandemic. We're from a small farm and we didn't really have too much going for us. And one of the things that happens was there was an investor that we had pitched this car sharing app to and they passed, but we maintained a good relationship with him. And he was a big, well-known guy in the auto industry. And he called us towards the end of 2020 and was like, Hey, I just got this consulting opportunity. I'm going to be helping the U S military launch a car sharing program on military bases in Germany, and the United States. The insurance companies want us to screen drivers, administer policies and manage claims in a specific way. I've told them you have the technology to do it. Would you license it to them? And so sure enough, my brother and I are trying to tell them, Hey, we'll, we'll white label the whole car sharing app to you guys. And they're like, no, we just care for the insurance software to manage the insurance workflows. And so my brother and I ended up starting a new business where we would essentially sell these insurance management tools to big buyers of insurance. And then what happens like a year ago is a lot of the companies were coming back to us and telling us, Hey, we're running all of our insurance through your systems. Can we buy insurance from your network of carriers or with you guys? And so that's when we end up opening up Aster Insurance Solutions, which is our licensed insurance entity or licensed insurance agency and a subsidiary of Lula. And that went gangbusters. We grew, yeah, like I mentioned, what is we it, like 40, 45 X in 20 months or yeah. something like that. We oh grew, yeah, so we grew, we now have more than 4,300 customers just in That's commercial amazing. auto space. And when we talk about commercial auto, I'm talking about car rental companies and trucking companies. And so we developed a pretty good customer base within those two markets and we have more than like I mentioned more than 4,300 insurance buyers in those two markets today and it's just I mean it's just been a crazy experience we um it, yeah and again this has all been commercial and a lot of that a lot of the reason why we decided to focus on the commercial came from our experience developing wonky surplus lines products dating back to when I was a college student trying to launch this first app mm. dude so much to unpack there. Yeah, uh, no if you don't mind, I got no, I got to ask a couple of little things because uh, if I'm thinking, it, surely the audience is okay. First of all, 18 years old in college, were you studying anything that had to do with technology or IT or you know, was this anything you were interested in prior? What? Yeah, it was it was more entrepreneurship. So Babson is is a school that is really focused on entrepreneurship and kind of oh, okay being really into innovation. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we all kind of like had this dream of being, you know, the next, uh, Steve jobs or the next, uh, yeah. Mark Zuckerberg and well, you know, Michael and Matthew just chased it relentlessly. Well, that was actually one of the funny things I, I got to Babs and wanting to go work on wall street. Like that was uh -huh. my thing. I want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year. I thought wall street was a great way. And then once I get to Babson, they, like Tito mentioned, they had this tremendous entrepreneurship culture. And so I started getting, and it's also in Boston, which is close to like Harvard and MIT. So yeah. I started seeing what was possible with entrepreneurship and technology, and I became fascinated with it. And so the original idea for Lula came because my brother and I wanted Papa John's pizza and they wouldn't deliver to campus. And oh, that is awesome. He, and, and he thought, it, he thought, man, it'd be really cool if we could rent another student's car out and go pick up the pizza. Yeah. And that's when, again, being in Babson, where they encourage this entrepreneurial spirit, that's where we had the idea, like, why don't we build it ourselves? Mm -hmm. And then as we started getting students to sign up for the app, we quickly started to hear from the parents, like, hey, what's going on with insurance? 
if somebody crashes my kid's car, how, uh, how is it going to be protected? And then one of the really interesting things that happened there was most of the insurance brokers didn't think it was worth their time because they thought like, oh, there's not going to be a single insurance carrier that's going to want to cover 18 year olds, drunk cars, from 18 year olds. And if there is, you guys aren't funded. So there's no way you're going to afford the minimum earned premium. And so that's one of the reasons why I had to start learning about the insurance industry so that I could represent us. And then I would eventually get licensed and all of that, which is a completely different story for another day. But one of the cool things is everybody thought college students would be super dangerous. We actually had a better performance than all the, the car rental companies and more traditional platforms like Turo, which were for older drivers. And How? while I wish I could, yeah, so I, I think industry average around this time was around 3.3 mm -hmm. accidents per million miles. We were at like 1.2 accidents per million miles. Wow. Yeah. And I'm just, gonna be, I'm just gonna be honest here. I wish I could say it was our underwriting criteria. I think it had more so to do with the fact that we saw a lot of usage in state schools, which were in suburban and rural areas. And so if you think about that, the kids yeah, are renting, like a, yeah. Three yeah, they're renting, trip. Yeah. yeah, they're renting cars in like these little towns. There's not a lot of risk exposure or anything like that. It's like, we made it a case to stay away from big cities like New York and stuff where there is really yeah. dense risk exposure. And so, I, Mateo, on, yeah. I, I wonder too, if uh, how big is Babson? Or I guess this was, a, this was a different colleges. So how big were the colleges that you were? Yeah, so it was mostly like the big state schools, so like University of Florida, Indiana, UCF. Uh, oh, those were the awesome. schools. So even yeah, so even though we were on more than 500 campuses in all 50 states, the yeah. schools where we saw the highest usage concentration were public state schools because they had 70 percent of students that were on financial aid, so they were much more price sensitive. Funny enough, Babson was probably our worst performing school. Oh, Babson was wow. 2,000 students, but Unlike state schools, 70% of Babson students were paying full tuition with no financial aid. So they were, they didn't care if you were going to save them five bucks for a trip, they didn't need it. Whereas the mm -hmm. kids in the state schools, they were much more dollar sensitive. And so the mm -hmm. state schools for us were a much better opportunity. That's fascinating. Incredible. Okay. So I want to fast forward just a little bit to Aster and getting started there just because I, I'm interested to know if, okay, so just for full transparency, if you don't mind me asking you, nobody's listening, just us four here. How, how old are you guys now? 27. Uh, oh, my gosh. Still oh my such young guys. Gosh, and that's to, crazy. And to have 4,300 <laughs> policies in that quick a time, like what was your marketing strategy there? How did you get from zero to 4,300 that quickly? It's kind of crazy that you, you, you ask about marketing strategy because uh, – by the time we start implementing a marketing strategy, I think we already had 4,000 customers. Okay, so, so then- we started, Actually, I would say we, start, we started implementing around 3,400, which is this summer. But the way we did it ultimately was referral was referral partners. So I, I'll, do, I'll give you like a really Unreal. interesting example. Turo, or yeah, actually let's use, let's take a step back. Yeah. Like, most car rent, most of these companies, especially on the commercial lines, because they have big fleets or they have pretty sophisticated businesses, they'll typically use this particular software vendor to run their entire business. So like you look at car rental companies, car rental companies, the number one software provider there is this company called H2 Rental Software. And so what we ended up doing with H2 Rental Software was doing a direct integration with them. And so now if somebody wanted insurance, they could literally just go into their portal and on the top right click, get insurance. And right there, because we had built the tech out, Lula would essentially scrape all their vehicle information and be able to put a bindable quote right in front of them within seconds. And if they wanted to ultimately move forward with it, they can do so in the click of a button. And so making it super convenient like that was what allowed us to grow so fast. And we just ended up finding, a, honestly, people think we had to get dozens of referral partners. We ended up finding three or three or four really high quality partners that allowed us to put that little button there and uh it ultimately ended up becoming a win-win because we would get great exposure and we would grow our business but because we were super selective about which referral partners or which companies we integrated with it now gave them an advantage over their competitors like hey 
you don't have to use three or four different vendors to run your book of business. We have, we're gonna provide you the software to manage your car rental fleet or your trucking fleet. And we're gonna make it even stickier by providing you super e uh, easy access to things like insurance. And so it made their platforms and their software tools way stickier. And it also gave us a massive customer base because when we would integrate with these referral partners, we get access to a thousand customers that we could pitch to on day one instead of having to go on the internet and run ad campaigns and all of that. Yeah. And these are qualified customers too, right? So these are people yeah. that you know, fit our ideal customer profile. So it's an embedded play. And I've heard of the embedded insurance and I've heard of that you know, buzzword that went around several years back, but I never heard of 20 something year olds implementing this. So kudos to you guys. It's my mind is blown. I told you guys when we started this, I was excited because it blew my mind. And so, you know, I have so many places I want to go, but I don't want to cut you off, Sid, if you have anything, because that, uh, I'm, my mind is blown yeah, right now. Yeah, so, okay, so just to clarify, you're saying that you guys sold uh, policies to, like, essentially individuals who are renting cars? That's the intro. No. no, so we would sell it to we would sell it to car rental companies and trucking companies. And so let's say you were a car rental company with 30 vehicles and you use HQ rental software to manage your reservations for your 30 vehicles. Uh, now we'd have a, there'd be a button on the HQ rental software portal and uh, they can put get insurance and then they'd be able to get it directly from us. Cause like, um, cause we were embedded already. Got it. Got it. Got it. So you're selling software to help these car rental companies manage their fleets and you're selling and, and business insurance essentially to, to insure the fleets. Correct. And one of the time. other things that, exactly. And one of the other things that was really interesting too, is like, if one of these companies traditionally went to, let's say a traditional insurance broker, all they were going to get from you was really insurance. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to run background checks on your customers or your employees, you have to figure out what tools you were gonna use to run your background checks. If you wanted to organize your policies for 30 different vehicles plus DNO and ENO and general liability and workers comp, a lot of these people were using like Google Drive and Dropbox or some sort of storage folder on their laptops. And then if they ever wanted to have a claim uh, or remove the full dependency of claims management from their insurance carrier mm -hmm. they'd hire people internally to do that mm -hmm. and so we would go to these companies and tell them hey with the click of a button you get access to this entire infrastructure mm -hmm. the screening tools the policy management the mm -hmm. claims monitoring all of that and you can get the coverage as well and wow. so being in such a specific niche whether it's car or trucking you know a lot of times you know you could cut out a lot of competition you know you know maybe you have that little sweat. what was your competition like four or five years ago, whenever you were getting this all going, what was that, what'd that look like for you guys? Man, it was the traditional brokers. <laughs> I, yeah? I can't tell you. Yeah. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of brokers funny enough that, um, they're not, they're not fans of us. Like I, I've read emails from, <laughs> uh, I've gotten, I've gotten messages Hi. like from more of it, some more of the traditional guys that like, Hey, would you trust a surgeon that's been doing surgery for a year? Or would you trust the surgeon that's been doing surgeries for 30 years? If so, if you trust the surgeon with 30 years, why are you trusting these young kids with your insurance? And uh, what people didn't get was we weren't doing like a traditional broker selling you insurance. We were essentially selling you a risk team in a box. And so while, yeah, that, that person might be able to help you with a bunch of stuff, everything they were giving you is really just words or advice. You'd still have to go act on it we were giving you everything so you can act on it on day one as well as a coverage and so yeah that was our, our competition was never other technology companies or other oh, like wow. modern day brokerages it was always the old school people and so we tito always likes to say we are competing with red uh with red wine and steak dinners like that was our main competition oh, that's good it still is yeah well i i'd say though that uh i mean they have a point though right i'm gonna push back a little bit because they they have a point that from an advice standpoint, I'm assuming that red wine and steak dinner has more relationships, probably a better understanding of the underwriting and risk, right? But where they're probably missing is, you know, they're not taking Ubers to red wine and steak dinner. 
right? You guys have the technology, you have the efficiency, you provide transparency. So the management of the insurance itself, that experience that you're giving people is where you guys just take the cake every time. Yeah. Right. And and, and and not to say that they can't get the technology and you can't get the advice, mm-hmm. but that seems to be the paradox. Right. So uh, one thing to 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 bring up there is that we figured that um, what at the end of the day, what we were really, really good at was distribution. Mm. So these embe- that's why we were able to get such a large number of customers with absolutely no marketing. Yeah, because we distributed really well. We made it really easy for them to be able to to hop on our programs. Yeah. Uh, that being said, we have learned the the importance of these steak dinners. Uh, th- th- that is something that we acknowledge and, and, and we know that it definitely creates value for the customers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we also know like we also have pretty good self-awareness. Like I knew, especially when we started getting to the more sophisticated and the bigger groups, you were going to need like Again, going back to self-awareness, I'm very much aware that when you walk in and you're in your mid-20s with long hair and a cap and baggy t-shirt and tight pants like I wear, you're going to get certain looks. And uh, even if I dress up a little bit nicer, a lot of times I'll we still get looks like, hey, who's this young kid walking into the room? So one of the things we also made sure to do was bring in some people that had experience in the space. So like one of the guys that we just brought on, he ran product development over at CSAA on the commercial lines. You have another guy that was um, was the CEO of a regional insurance carrier doing about $500 million a year in premium as well. And so we definitely brought on a couple people so that our customer base would have those more seasoned veterans that they could also lean on for advice if they ever needed it. Mm-hmm. And one, this is like Tito said, one of the things that allowed us to grow so quickly was the fact that we made it really easy Mm -hmm. to buy our products without ever having to speak to a human. I think most agencies mess up by requiring some sort of human interaction. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we did was we made sure that our seasoned execs and people were available 24 Mm seven. And so a lot of times Mm -hmm. these agencies, they'll mess up, they'll give you a, a customer service rep as like the first line of defense. We would obviously offer that too. But the other thing that we offered was like instant access to the more seasoned. If you want, if you had a really complex question, it was like, hey, you have access to Joe. Go talk to him right now. I'll give you his email and I'll give you his phone number. And that type of customer experience, that type of engagement, that type of access was another thing that just separated us from the pack in terms of customer experience Mm -hmm. and made it so that we just got nonstop referrals. Yeah. um, Because that's been our biggest thing has been word of mouth referrals and a lot of it comes down to the the customer experience i mean look at the end of the day i think the fact that you guys exist proves that the market needs and wants more efficiency in their insurance experience and just a better experience in general so so while we might say that there are benefits to having you know steak and, and red wine at the end of the day that's just not enough it's just not enough and i think agents need to hear that like uh, you know, it's, it's don't turn this conversation as you guys are listening into like an either, or it's, Oh, you know, it's either red wine and steak. You're still taking an Uber to dinner at the end of the day, yeah. right? Both like you, you, you have to, you have to figure out a way to, to have both. Um, and you guys have done an incredible job of not only I'd say like carving out edges in the unknown of how to use technology in that insurance experience, but also um, being self-aware enough to say, okay, if, if our if our gap is ad- advisorship, then like, how do we, you know, how do we fill that gap, um, fill that need? So like, kudos to you for the work. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, you to your point, I had like 15 questions, and you got me. I'm like, sorry. Okay. No, but to <laughs> your to your point that you're talking about, my question to you, and this may sound like a funny question, but it's all right though. Do you do you think by coming into it? not from an insurance background and just kind of come as college kids, mm-hmm. not knowing what we know now, what that pale mail and stale does that kind of helped you of not having, does that make sense? Like you didn't have, yeah. like, if it was me coming into it, I'd think I have to do it this way, this way, and this way. But you guys came into it, like didn't know any better. So this is what yeah. you did. Do you think that helped you to charge forward? If that question makes sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think absolutely. And we kind of did that by design. So I eventually got my insurance licenses um 
so I can be the license agent on. intentional about having non-insurance people be part of the design process and the customer experience process. That way we're, we can bring a fresh perspective and see where we can move unnecessary or bar uh, unnecessary barriers or areas of friction and things like the sign-up process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And so, uh, and I appreciate your honesty. I didn't know how to ask that question, but yeah. you brought up customer experience, a customer journey. And Tito, I'd be interested to know, like, you know, as you talk through that and technology type things that got going on, do you use a lot of technology and have a lot of, you know, uh, marketing campaigns or what is the customer journey look like? Is there a lot of technology involved in that since you don't have a lot of human interaction? Yeah. Yeah. So we just the, the checkout itself is entirely self-serve. Okay. So you can see the limits of the policy, what it entails, what, what, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll actually dive a little a bit deeper, uh, the Turo policies that, that, that we provide to some customers. Uh, Turo is, um, you know, kind of new. Uh, a lot of people know them already, but the real problem is how do you classify those cars? Do you classify them as a commercial use asset or, or a personal use asset? Because a lot of times these are people's personal vehicles and, you know, they're not making enough money to buy a commercial policy for that vehicle. So, for example, let's say Allstate finds out that you're renting your car on Turo on your personal policy. What they're going to do is that they're going to drop you off. Uh, they're they're, they're going to they're gonna drop you from that policy. So we come in and we say, hey, look, come to Lula, get a, a policy that has certain restrictions. We make those restrictions extremely clear throughout the self-serve flow. Um, we track each stage of that self-serve flow so that if needed, and if we see, you know, an hour has gone by since you read the description and there hasn't been a checkout yet, we know you, they probably have a little bit of, of uh, doubts or questions on why uh, this works for them. So we'll give them a call. And uh, oh, wow. that's we also like don't take away the human element of it. We have AEs that are willing to, to you know, get their hands dirty and call the customer and explain everything about the policy that they would need to know. And uh, the further along that they go, through the self-serve, you know, they they, um, they eventually check out, bind a policy, and create an account on Lula's portal, uh, which then they can download all of their documentations. So for example, their COIs and their insurance cards are available probably within, what, 20 minutes of them starting the process. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of that is enabled by technology. And so, from there, what happens once they bind a policy? Is there a journey from there? When do you hit them again? Do you talk to them throughout? Do they get drips? Anything like that? Um, at times, yeah. So we'll 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 uh, update them with anything about their policy that they need to know. So okay. of course, when renewal comes, we'll we'll give them an update there, and we'll 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 ask them if they want to renew, depending on if their policy has changed at all. Um, a lot of automated emails, anything regarding the claims process is also paperless, so okay. they can submit everything through our portal. Um, and they also get automated email um, updates on their claims process. So I'd say once they, uh, once they sign up, they also have you know, immediate access to our customer support team and an account manager that will help them grow their fleets, because that's, that's another thing. Uh, this kind of tech has helped our customers grow their fleets, grow their businesses um, pretty pretty crazily. So it, it's it's a constant flow of touch points, I'd say. One of the things that we always like to do is we we try whenever we're thinking about the customer experience, we try to lead with technology, but always make humans available. And I think a lot of the more modern day groups they just try to lead with technology and avoid the human experience entirely 
And so we've always tried to do some sort of hybrid experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we've seen really well because one of the most frustrating things ever is, let's say something got messed up on your COI and now all of a sudden you have to start scouring the web trying to find a customer support email or a phone number or anything like that. Mm -hmm. We always try to be like, hey, we'll try to, we'll give you the tools to fix it with technology, but we're going to make it clear that if you want to call somebody on the phone or if you want to send somebody directly a text or email, we'll give you that option as well. And so lead by technology, but having humans available, I think is also something that's been really beneficial to us. <laughs> Are you giving me, you didn't ask 15 questions. No, I, I didn't, but I mean, <laughs> so they're, they're leading me into the, the big, the big thing I wanted to oh, get into. Oh, is that, is that why you're raising your eyes Because you're like, do we say? I'm, I'm looking we, at do you like, do we, do, do we, we tell not? everybody what's going on now? Um, I guess I could, you know, lead into that with, you know, tell you brought in humans, you've, you've added some people there. What does your team look like now? Um, and how many licensed people do you have versus people like Mike uh, or is Michael? You know, what, what does that look like on your team as Heath, of right this minute? Heath is trying to tell you guys that we're about to put the icing on this cake. Yeah, so, we are. So, you know. <laughs> Here's yeah. the spatula. Let's go. I'm getting the crumb coat goading now, and then I'm going <laughs> to go from there. Yeah, I'd, yeah so I'd say it's usually like another great statistic, like less than 10% of our team is is less, is less is licensed people. So we probably have like five or six licensed people right now that hold some sort of insurance licenses, whether it be on the actuarial side, whether it be on the PNC side, surplus lines, all that different stuff. The overwhelming majority of our people on the team are non-insurance. And a lot of that mm. comes down to the fact that we've been able to automate so many of these processes. Um, yeah, I, one of the other licenses I forgot to mention, like the, the customer support license. It's like we have that on the support line too in case insurance comes up. But I'd say less than 10% of our of our team bases has insurance licenses. And people hear that and they're like, oh my God, yes, it's just small sales or support team or whatever. It's like, well, we lead with technology and that's why we've been able to, to maintain such a such a small team. Uh, there's a, an insurance licensed person on your team that's really raised a lot of eyebrows in the industry that we've been able to to hear about a lot lately. Do you remember the name of this yeah. person? Or? Oh, is it is it is it Gail? I is think that, it's, it's Gail, is right? Is that who you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. When, when people have heard oh. Gail, this why is why are people surprised that Gail? Is being is a licensed insurance producer. Oh, you right are now. walking into this so well, man. I just I'm gonna hug you after this podcast. <laughs> so, um, Gail, I guess you could say, an, an employee of Lula, is um, a completely virtual intelligence agent. So, Whoo! Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, wait, <laughs> yeah. wait, 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 wait. What did you just say? <laughs> Not a real so, person. Not a not a real person. Uh, she's real to us. Well, I guess you can. Uh, right, it's right, real right. is subjective at this point. But when yeah, you're talking exactly. virtual, you're not talking about somebody in the Philippines or in Mexico or another no. country. You're talking. We're talking a computer algorithm <laughs> that was able to pass a mm, mm, state licensing mm, exam. Mm. Is this the first ever? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. The, fir the first AI to pass insurance licensing exams and. Uh, it did so that in Florida, nice. California, Texas, and New York, and we're working on doing the rest of the country now. Insane. Um, which has been fun. Well, actually, one of the funny things about this thing, Gail, so what we refer to as Gail, we refer to Gail like the sexy one-liner is an insurance AI that can sell insurance and can also service customers indistinguishably from a human. Now, one of the really funny things that people hear, or what people ask us when they hear that, that explanation, is like, does Gail know insurance? Here's like my favorite Gail story so far. Yes. When we were training Gail to pass the exams, we hired tutors and professors and, and took courses. By the end of it, Gail's knowledge on insurance became so significant, it started correcting the tutors that were hired to train it. Oh my and, uh, gosh, stop. That yeah. is funny. <laughs> this is like Will Smith and I wrote. <laughs> right? This is crazy. So, but That's I think amazing. it's funny too is That's Gail's amazing. got a license and your brother doesn't. Which I think is really funny. <laughs> Gail, know, Gail knows way more about insurance than my brother. That's for sure. I mean, Gail's been, yeah, and Gail, Gail, I, yeah, Gail's been around for a couple of months. My brother's been in and out for like six or seven years, and uh, and Gail runs circles around them. That is wild. But you you talked about okay. First of all, go, go back a little. Tell me like the history, like get, where Gail came from. Give me a little bit of that because then yeah. I want to get the audience in. Because right now oh. I've had. 
people pulling over their cars to listen, or they've tripped because they've been scared while they're running, whatever it might be. People are excited to hear this. Go back a little bit and tell me about where Gail came from. So um, I, I love that we spoke about the history of, of our company prior because now I can refer back to it. Uh, everything that we've built has been out of necessity, not you know uh, popularity. So think of Lula, the ride sharing app. Michael and Matthew wanted to go get Papa John's, so they built something out of necessity that would get them there cheap and efficiently. Um, think about you know Lula software today. Michael and Matthew needed uh, software to manage their insurance policies within Lula rides. Um, so they built that software and the business evolved. And the cool thing is that we built Gale because we saw a need for it internally. Uh, we talked about you know our support team. We talked about uh, our growth in customers. Um, one of the crazy things about growing this quickly is that you experience some growing pains. And even if we would want people to be on the phone 100% of the time, uh, we had so many customers calling in that we inevitably had some missed calls. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get nightmares with a number of Tito's about a game. Yeah, <laughs> some um, PTSD. I, I looked up. Yeah, <laughs> I looked up. Uh, you know our, our statistics on it, and I saw that we had a uh, hundred thousand missed calls in twelve months. Oh my gosh! Um, and the great and the crazy, wow. the crazy thing about that the great thing about that too is like we were hiring virtual assistants. We tried BPOs. We tried hiring more people, and we were still missing calls. Yeah. Attrition rates were awful, as you guys know, to be like support people and stuff. Yeah. Um, training costs were high, recruiting costs were higher than ever. And so we were just trying to figure out, we're like, wait, what if we can build an AI that could essentially answer all these calls or make all these calls on our behalf, both on the sales and support side. And because people want to speak to a human, they wouldn't know that it was an AI. They would think it was an actual human. And so mm -hmm. we started thinking about Gale probably, I'd say a year ago before it became the buzzword of the year. And um, that was the ultimate inspiration. It was like, we tried to build it for ourselves internally. And as we started showcasing it to people the past couple of months, they were like, oh man, this, we could use it ourselves. And I'll never forget, Tito was, Tito was trying to convince me around August, like, hey, this is something insurance agencies might want. And he, I was unsure. And he just he decided didn't to get believe it. Me. I didn't believe him, so he get, he take, <laughs> He, he takes my car on like a Friday afternoon, calls me back like two hours later and is like, yo, do we have a contract? I'm like, what do you mean a contract? He's like, yeah, I spoke to a couple of agency owners who asked me when they can sign up for Gale. Tito, are you um, serious? That's amazing. That, that is awesome. That was it. Like, he walked, he I, walked in without anything. I cold walked he, in he to different insurance agencies around Miami. Oh my and gosh. I think uh, over one afternoon. That is crazy. That Friday. I went to five agencies that I just I just looked it up on Google like hey insurance agencies near me, um, and after important I important to know I, no business cards no website uh, no flyer no anything yeah. literally just okay I got to hear what was your pitch give me your pitch also, Sid and I own an agency <laughs> and we're wanting to, like give me your pitch when you walked in cold so I walked in cold and I was like basically. You know, we're building a voice powered AI that can sell to and service customers of insurance. And what we want to do is make sure that you never have a missed call again. When you're calling your insurance company, um, it can either be because you want to give them money and it can either be because you're trying to file a claim. But fundamentally, it's not just a chat. So you want your, uh, your insurance company to pick up the phone no matter what, because it could be the worst day of your life. Mm. So what if you could provide that service to your customers? So we're not building this for you. We're building it to make your customers happy. And uh, yeah, let me have a meeting with my partner here real yeah, quick. Yeah, 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 yeah. we're in. Yeah. <laughs> we're in. Wow. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little rusty on that. But no, that was but my, my overall idea. If pretty, that was the rusty um, version. Yeah, that was pretty solid. Man. That was pretty solid. And. Of those five agencies that I cold walked into, uh, within a week, we had signed letters of intent for two of them. Oh my uh, gosh. Um, so, and I think the other three have already signed up as well. So, um, and, no, and 
that led us to go down this crazy rabbit hole. It's interesting that the timeline there, because this was August, you said, I saw you a month later, you know, in Naples, Florida at a conference and you had people lined up at your table and you gave some demos throughout the weekend. And it was like, yeah. blew up all over, you know, this conference about you guys doing that. And yeah. it's just so crazy to see a month or know that a month prior to that you had stole his car to go do some cold calls and now it's the buzzword of the year yeah i mean one of the crazy things too is like when we decided to go up so this was one of the crazy things was we knew a lot of these insurance agencies were not going to have engineers or product people in-house so we were like all right this thing is going to likely launch around april of next year we're going to close the wait list at 2500 because we want to handhold everybody mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that we'll do the integrations for them and we'll set it up and we'll do it with no implementation or integration fee. and we gave it 2500 because we thought realistically that's what we could handle and we also thought it was going to take a couple months in order to fill up that wait list we man we started filling that thing up so quick after that pia conference we actually ended up having to extend it <laughs> and our engineer our engineering team is on tito and i's ass right now because they're like stop extending the <laughs> the, 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 the size list. of the pre-order list but um but yeah it's just it's been something that that we could that we could have never honestly imagined and it goes back to that thing that tito mentioned like We've always built for ourselves. Like people think here the AI stuff, they thought we were building it to be trendy or whatever. We built it to solve our own problems and we just found that the rest of the industry could mm -hmm. benefit from it as well. And yep. as soon as we saw that, we decided like, hey, nobody else is building this in the world of insurance. We might as well do it. And this is this goes back to what we talked about before we got on the show. If you look at AI as a whole, like chat GPT and Bard phenomenal technologies, game changers. I think they're probably gonna be the most important technologies of our uh, of my generation. Mm -hmm. But what happens is those companies scraped every single piece of free information off the internet. And if you think about insurance, most insurance information is in some sort of database or something behind a paywall. Yep. And if you don't necessarily have to pay for it, you still have to create an account. And so what we decided to do was to essentially take that open AI like approach, but for the world of insurance. And so we hired a team of engineers to go state by state, creating accounts in the for the Office of Insurance Regulation, the Departments of Insurance to start getting all those laws and regulatory components and training the AI on it. And so that's one of the reasons why we were able to become the first AI to pass the licensing exams. It was because we were really the first ones to start paying attention yeah. to how nuanced the world of insurance is and that a generic AI was not going to work for our very nuanced right. industry. Right. And so that was one of the reasons why we decided like, hey, let's go all in on, being, on building this insurance specific AI. And now it makes the agencies and the insurance companies we sell to feel way more confident in the technology because they can sleep at night knowing that, hey, if my customer asks something, it's gonna they're gonna get an accurate information because it's been trained on that specifically. Yeah, like this isn't a solution where uh, of a uh, like a, ver a non vertical vertical specific solution, right? Where you're just saying, well, it can service a client, meaning it can mm -hmm. pick up a phone call and say, hi, how are you? What do you need? Right, and then at that mm -hmm. point, like layer two, now it's gotta be passed off to a real person. You're saying yeah. this thing can go like six layers deep and get into coverage conversations and you know help find coverage information uh, and help yeah. maybe even you know get the carrier on board with certain things, right? Pass information to the carrier, whatever that looks like. Um, and yeah, go ahead, go ahead. That's, that's actually, you, you bring up a really good point because that's uh, what I believe is also one of our main differentiators, mm -hmm. that because we are insurance specific, we are able to um, build out those integrations into you know the different AMS systems, the different CRMs that are insurance agency specific, yeah. connect to the different uh, VoIP providers um, that, that insurance agencies use. If we were not insurance specific, we wouldn't have the bandwidth to do that because we'd also right. be focused on financial services, hospitality, right. logistics, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and again, why would we focus on 
a very regulated insurance industry. Yeah. So we've we've kind of fell fall. Sorry, uh, we 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 fell into um, a completely untouched uh, market wow. and a need that was not being served at all. Yeah. Um, quite literally ignored, just because it's tough. And it, I was gonna say. Tough, yeah. Tito, tough. You guys picked the hardest vertical to go after. I mean, not only in terms of the regulatory issues and, and roadblocks, right? You have to have a license and all this stuff, but also the complexity of the product. I mean, my gosh, there's so many, there's so much variation and nuance in insurance. Um, it's really impressive that you guys are tackling this. L let me ask you a quick question because I know this is coming up in every insurance agent's mind. We have to address it. Um, so security, right? I think most people hear ChatGBT and I mean, either they're thinking, my gosh, we're in a Will Smith world where we're all gonna get taken over and replaced, right? But also <laughs> more than that, step before that is, well, if I put my information into ChatGBT, now everybody has access to it, right? And that's something Vertifor is very careful about is, hey, don't put any product specific, development specific information in there. Don't put any client information in there because once it's in there, it's like it's like putting it into a a you know bucket that you can't get get it back out of. Yeah. Um, how does that work with 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 Gale? Like, do you guys have if you're connecting into AMS three sixty for example? Like, mm. do you do you make sure that other agencies can't see client information and protect that? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So one of the things that we do is each agency is going to essentially have access to their own closed environment. So they can rest assured that the data is not going to be so mingling with other agencies data okay. and stuff like that. And then one of the other things that we're doing too, is like, even from a back end administrative side of things, we're having protections in it. So people at Lula themselves won't be able to see the data on a per agency by agency basis too. And so not only can the agency owners or the insurance carriers sleep at night knowing like, hey, get, uh, this other agency is not going to see my data. They can also rest assured as well that, hey, there's not going to be some random engineer at Lula that has, has access to it as well. Mm -hmm. And so security has been something that's super top of mind for us. Mm -hmm. And that's why we decided like, hey, we're going to go to the giving each agency essentially their own closed environment to avoid that co-mingling. And so avoid just opening yourself up to this massive exposure of risk. Yeah, and to, just to add on to that, uh, a lot of like these Google or ChatGPT, they're in the business of data monetization. Mm. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think it was, I don't remember who said it, but a pretty famous quote is that if you don't know how they make money, it means that you're the product. <laughs> um, I think it was based on off of Facebook. And we are not in the business of data monetization at all. So we have no incentive to, you know, release anything about customers at all, because we know that once you lose trust with agencies, um, you're probably never going to get it back. Yeah. So it's top of our mind 24-7. Yeah. 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 Thank you guys for answering. There's, that opens up so many other things. But I do want to get into while we're on the subject of what's been because we've been talking about how excited we are about it and some of that kind of stuff, but what's been some, some other major pushbacks you've gotten, if you don't mind running down that trail, because I know people are thinking it. So let's jump on it head first. You know, Mateo, if you want to start with some, one of the biggest pushbacks you've gotten. Yeah, the big pushback that we originally got was how, how can we assure that this thing knows insurance? And so check that off the box. As soon as we passed the exam, that was kind of able to put the skeptics to rest. Now, the big, the other big thing that we that we've had to deal with is just like is the fear, people thinking, oh my God, they're coming after us, they're trying to take our jobs, and I'd say that's by far the biggest pushback that we get today is is somewhat fear mongering and completely valid concerns. What I would say there is, and I'll I'll make this PG thirteen just to get a laugh, but it's also true. Anybody that tells you this technology is going to entirely replace entirely replace agents is a dumbass that does not understand the technology. Mm -hmm. Like this technology, like Tito always says, it's gonna 
do the low ROI type of tasks, like reminding somebody that there's a renewal coming, doing the discovery calls when you get a new need, doing the scheduling. It's going to do that type of stuff, and it's going to allow the agents to focus on those higher ROI type tasks. And so for us, that's the biggest pushback we get is the fear that we're trying to replace people. It's like, no, we're actually trying to reduce the amount of manual work, the amount of little tedious tasks that you're doing, and we're paving the way so you can take care of those bigger ticket items. You can take care of those bigger sales that might be a little bit more of an extended sales cycle without getting uh, bogged down with all the little stuff as well. So like like a great example of this is uh, we've seen a trend that around 80% of inbound calls to insurance agencies are simply payment FAQs. Like, hey, when is my you know premium due? Sure. Hey, when is my premium going to go down? Uh, why did I get charged this amount? That kind of stuff. And that's like, like Matthew, well, Matthew quoting me said, uh, those are low <laughs> ROI activities. Um, and those are activities that my hypothesis is also uh, attribute to high attrition rates between support reps and sales reps, because it's stuff that you need to do, but realistically, they're not fulfilling to them. So our idea is um, to increase the output of your existing staff by reducing those, uh, you know, tedious day-to-day -day activities. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I mean, I think here for agencies out there that are reacting emotionally to that, you know, to that fear, I I challenge you to think about the entrance of ver uh, VAs right to the insurance industry. I remember when VAs came onto mm -hmm. the into the playing field like 3 years ago in an impactful way. And you know, interestingly, I don't remember anyone saying, "Oh no, VAs are going to take over the agency." I I remember it being like, "Okay, that's interesting. Why would I have a VA? Like what are they actually going to do?" And then now we're at this point 3 years later where I I mean, almost any agency I talk to has a VA in their agency at, in some capacity because their team doesn't want to spend time sending certificates, taking payment phone calls, uh, you know, manually entering data into multiple systems, whatever that looks like. So if you have a VA, I would just say think about, you know, and I'm sorry VA companies out there, but think about this as like an alternative to a VA as opposed to like an alternative to your team member, right? Like that's that's not what we're talking about. You got to break apart what you're you know, service team does or your sales team does and start to think about it more in, uh, you know, not not as a person, but as a set of tasks that you can sort of like allocate to different systems like AI, like VA or to a team member. So yeah, I think it goes back to what y'all were saying earlier with the agency that you want to have technology to enable your people to be able to do what they do best. And I think yeah. that's probably where Gail came from as well. And I'm hoping agencies hear that. They're listening yeah, now. So, yeah. Of those 100,000 missed calls that we had, I think probably around 60% of it were just endorsements to their policies. It was just mm. saying, hey, I sold this car. Can you please take it off my policy? Mm -hmm. Or, hey, can you add this registered driver to my policy? Mm -hmm. That's it. Yep. So it's, again, it was super easy stuff to solve. It would have taken us 10 minutes. But, you know, maybe they called at 6 p.m. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe they called um, on a Saturday because they've been working Monday to Friday and they were exhausted every day. Mm -hmm. You know, so so one of the things that we're really, really focused on is what are the results that we want to see when Gail comes to use? Mm -hmm. One is uh, the, the, the probably the biggest one that I'm trying to focus on is an increase in revenues from receiving what would have otherwise been missed calls and an increase in customer satisfaction from always being available to your customer. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's, that's kind of what it boxes down to. Yeah. So I, I know Sid and I have a lot more questions, a lot more, but you know, for time's sake, you know, people listening, I can't believe it's already been that long. I want to end on a super easy question and then we'll wrap up. But I've got some other people in the studio with me now that you can't see, uh, producers and you know, helping with sound and whatnot. But the question is, uh, Gail. Does Gail stand for something? Where did Gail come from and yeah. how, why did you choose the name Gail? Yeah, that's a great question. So we'll end with an easy softball there. Oh, Matthew, uh, you're muted. Uh-oh. So I can, I can answer. Uh, 
<laughs> rookie mistake, Mateo. Yeah. I know, man. I know. Um, um, so yeah, so it stands oh. for generative AI by Lula. So it's funny oh. if you see awesome. if you see our seat. Yeah. So we made That's t-shirts right. where we kind of went the Mark Jacobs route. Our t-shirts say Gale by Lula, but if you break up Gale, it ends up becoming like Gale uh, generative AI by Lula by Lula. And so um, we're bringing the Mark Jacobs type fashion stuff to the world of technology and insurance. Listen, I'm all here for uh, something other than black suits, black ties, and black right. socks and black shoes. So let's go. I like it. Okay. So, you know, as we wrap up here, you know, first of all, do you have any anything, anything else? No, no. You we got, got the audience question in there with Gail, I'm, so that was good. Um, if you guys, uh, if you don't mind, is there any you know way they could look? Like, is there a website they can go to? Contact info for you guys. If you don't mind giving a little bit of that, because I know there's people that have questions, or you may get hate mail. Who knows? Yeah. How but, do they sign up for their uh-huh. Tesla? How do they pre-order their Tesla here? There you go. Uh, just go to meetgale.com. M e e t g a i l dot com, uh, and you can get into contact with anybody from our team there. Uh, and I'll even give you guys my my personal email. It's uh, Tito T I T O at Lula dot uh, I S. So right. feel free to reach out to us either way. Nice. Um, and I even encourage uh, the non believers, uh, just because it always gives me an idea of how to improve, hmm. um, or what like understand why don't they believe, and it helps me improve as well. So uh, everything is welcome. Excellent. Mateo, anything to add to that or Tito handle it all? Uh, I'd say, no, he handled it good. My email is just same domain, but Matthew instead of Tito. People can message me as, as well if they want or message me on LinkedIn too. Uh, I respond to more DMs than I probably should. <laughs> there you go. Guys, I, I told you we're going to blow your mind. We're going to talk about some stuff we don't normally talk about here. And we were going to challenge your thought process here. You know, first of all, thank you, Tito and Mateo, for joining us. Thank you, guys, the audience, for joining us today on the podcast. Sid, thanks for hanging out with me here. What a fun conversation. Guys, have a great day, and we'll catch you on the next one. Well, that was a great episode. Amazing. It was an amazing episode. I really enjoyed that content. Guys, if you enjoyed that content and you want more of it, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Nah, dude. You got to tell them to crush it. Crush that subscribe button, guys. All right. Whether you want to crush it, smash it, hit it. Bop it? Sure. We could bop it. Either way, guys, we don't want you to miss another episode. We enjoy spending time with you, the VIP. Yeah. We'll see you next week.